I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I kind of like it. Just a bit about that wood, which is really going to date me. I felled that tree in 1972, so 49 years ago. And that's a 17 inch wide plank. And I have actually wider planks out of that tree. It was the biggest walnut I've ever felled. Um, it's about four and a half feet in diameter. Uh, and to offset some of my costs, because in 1972, I didn't have any money. So I sold a bunch of the gunstock blanks to, to recoup some of my costs of transporting it and getting it sawed up. So anyway, it uh, finally found a purpose. Anyway, enough lollygagging. I've got to get back at chinking. So eventually I have um, the entire outside of the cabin chink now, working on the inside, um, rather tedious. Um, if in the two gable ends up here, uh, I still have to do those funny little corners where the logs meet the sheeting of the roof line. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to forge out a tool for that. Um, something small enough and a little smaller pallet, I guess, to get into those corners going to be a little difficult and I also have to make the um, little triangular wooden ends for the very peak piece and uh, yeah that part will be finished and uh, then I'm going to put uh, an oil on the outside of the logs as a protection so we'll be working on that soon.
So uh, this has been rather an exciting morning. I heard uh, sandhill cranes first thing this morning. So I took a poke back to the wetland and uh, they nest pretty early. Uh, so I thought maybe they'd have their little ones and sure enough, first time I've got it and I was actually able to sneak up pretty close on one. But the really exciting part about today is we're finally getting to the uh, making the chimney here. And I've got Luke Soames here from L. Soames Masonry, and uh, yep. he's, a, he's a masonry master. <laughs> well, so, yeah, we do what we can. Say yep. hello, Luke. Yeah, how's everybody doing today? <laughs> there you go. Anyway, uh, Luke's statement for, uh, for his company is statements in stone. And uh, yeah, he's a master at this, and he's uh, giving me some pointers here. And actually, I shouldn't say pointers, he's doing it. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I'm his gopher today. Anyway, Luke, you're doing a great job here, and uh, we're going to get this done today, right? Luke? Yeah, we're going to get the base of the firebox down today so it can set up, and then, uh, then on the next day, we can uh, carry on the firebox walls up after this stage. Yeah. And then we, uh, then you're gonna let me get at the stone, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. He, he, he's he's got the uh, the boss's hat on right, right there. You got yeah. the boss's hat. Anyway, so uh, yeah, we'll be showing the progress as we uh, as we move up with the chimney. Okay. Carry I'll let you bit. back to it, Luke. Yep. Look at me. Sounds good. This is about the e easiest job I've had in this build, <laughs> right here. Seems odd, I've done everything myself up to this point, and uh, anyway, there's no way I could master this in oh, a short time. After watching one go around, you'll do the next one by yourself. I don't think I got another fireplace <laughs> in me, Luke. This might be my last fireplace. Okay. So it's looking good there, Luke. How uh, how long have you been at this business? Uh, I'm 39 this year, and I've been doing it since I was right out of high school, so pretty well 18 years old, even doing it summers before that. So a long time, and uh, my father and my grandfather, they, they both did this. It's been kind of in the family forever, and, and it's, uh, it's what we do. So you're keeping the tradition going. Yeah, right? yeah. Family tradition, I love that. That's, yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so you built rum for before you're telling me you built a really big one one time. Yeah, I built a couple of 100% uh, Rumford fireplaces in my life and uh, one of them uh, a few years back was very large. Uh, don't remember the exact dimensions, but I could almost stand inside of it. Wow. Uh, it was it was very big. Big uh, required a 24 inch square flue tile. Um, just the flue tiles themselves were like 250 pounds a piece. Uh, was a very large unit. And how did how did you ever get the throat in? Uh, well, it, it was it was a lot of lifting. <laughs> I'm not going to give all the secrets, but it was a lot of lifting and and carrying on. It was a quite a project, but really nice to see. There's a, do a lot of fireplaces nowadays, and to see some people to, still doing them that traditional way is uh, is really outstanding to see. Yeah. And when done properly, when done a hundred percent to Rumford specs, they are extremely efficient. Um, some of the fireplaces people want nowadays are a little bit deeper firebox and they look nicer, but they're really not efficient. These shallow straight back Rumford styles, they will heat your home and they do a very good job of it. 
Good. Good to know. Yeah. Seeing as we got to cut all the firewood, that's good to know. <laughs> you, you make this bad boy as efficient as yeah, you can. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah, because we do have to cut and split a lot of wood. Uh huh. Well, it's coming along. It's looking really nice. So, Luke, my friend, here's a toast to a finished hearth. Yeah, we got the hearth down. Yeah. One, one step closer, and actually our first tankard. Yep. In the uh, Cedar Hollow Tavern. Okay. So, we're going to let that set for a few days. Yeah, we'll let it set, let it get hard, and uh, and then in a few days we'll start the walls on uh, on the firebox. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. And uh, yeah. once that chimney's done, I've got some bit of closure to do on the place, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, yeah, we're going to be moving in. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's we got a nice warm day anyway, so it's a little while before we need to light that fire, but we got some time anyways. There you go. There you go. You <laughs> yeah. have time to go some bear hunting. Maybe so. Day. Maybe so, yeah. So the spring bear hunt's on, and, and Luke here is a, a avid uh, bear hunter, <laughs> hound raiser, raises some of the best hounds in the province. Oh, I know, not uh, at all by any means, but we have fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. he's a bit, yeah. he, he's a bit <laughs> modest, this fellow. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to uh, be joining him on one of these bear hunts one of these days. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if, uh, if you'll have me. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. anytime, okay. anytime. Well, cheers to that. You bet. ago we had uh, a huge frog breeding frenzy in our pond and within a few days they'd laid their egg masses and now a few days later we've got thousands literally thousands of tiny little tadpoles swimming in the pond so should be a really good year for the frog population. So taking a bit of a break from the cabin build and getting back to my tanning hides and uh, we're at this stage now I think there's seven steps to get this far can't remember how many hours but I can certainly remember the laboring doesn't look like something you'd want to wear so the object at this point is to go from this to this and there's four more steps to get here um, so brain tan leather is soft it's chamois like and the difference between it and commercially tanned um, deer hide is it, it's soft but it's actually leather it's a soft leather and it, it doesn't breathe this is quite a comfortable fabric to wear it does breathe it's washable um, super soft very comfortable so this part of the process is not for the faint of heart um, traditionally the brains were used there's enough tannin in um, in the brains of any animal to tan its own hide so I've got a boat mm, two pounds or so here which is ample enough to do three of the six hides that I have here so what I got to do is get a little bit of warm water in there and get my fingers in there and uh, mush it up what I'm trying to do is make sort of a soupy mixture don't want lumps in it um, this may seem uh, like an awful chore to some but if you lived in the 1700s it was just a day-to-day -day job just something you had to get done all right I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and uh, get at this Okay, so temperature wise, water's a bit hot. You want it sort of really hot bath water temperature. So if it's too hot for my hide, it's gonna to be too hot for the deer's hide. So I'm just gonna let that cool a bit. I'm gonna mix in my solution, and then we're gonna get the first uh, 
First of her hides into the tanning solution. Perfect. Temperature. So, don't understand how they figured it out, but indigenous people around the globe essentially use the same method to make their clothing. Um, and they had no means of communication, certainly not between continents. Um, but anyway, they all figured it out that there was enough tannin in the brain of an animal to do its own hide. So, that's our solution. We're gonna mix that up and we're gonna get our first hide in. Essentially what we have to do at this point is we just have to keep working this and we're going to take that stiff old thing it's going to become like, like a soft wet rag here and once we got one done we can put another one in. So someone in a comment asked me, um, not a comment, a question asked me um, what's all the shiny stuff on my clothes and my shooting bag but if we go back to the time period that is my persona so mid 1700s Trade silver was an extremely popular trade item, particularly with the natives. Some were just ornamental, some had symbolic uh, um, purposes to them. For example, this is a, called a council badge. So natives would be gifted that one. They wouldn't have to trade something for it. But they like trade silver so much, they as easily trade three beaver pelts for a, 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 a conchi or or some form of trade silver as they would a blanket or a, or a, or a metal iron knife. Um, so it started in the 17th century, early 17th century with the Dutch, and sort of ended around mm, 1820 or so was sort of the end of it. But the heyday of it was 1780 to 1820. And at that time, the Northwest Trade Company were in competition, obviously, with the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company were extremely reluctant to put trade silver on their trade items because it was too costly for them. And it was all about the money then, and it's still all about the money now. So, but they realized by, uh, I believe it was 1796, that if they didn't put trade silver out there, they were losing too many um, furs to the Northwest Company. So they introduced it into their trade items. Um, that rivalry and competition lasted until 1821, when Hudson Bay took over the Norwesters. And uh, they immediately, in 1821, took trade silver off, off of their list. So there are oil paintings from the 1700s and 1800s that shows prominent natives, chiefs perhaps, um, totally covered, literally, their clothing in trade silver. Um, and during that, that heyday, um, there were essentially five places in North America where trade silver was being produced. So we had uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec City, Philadelphia, New York, and Detroit. Uh, and some of those places, I, mean, I found reference that one, of the, um, one in Quebec City uh, actually employed over 30 engravers uh, making trade silver. So crazy popular. It could Not only was it something that they could wear as an ornament, but it could actually be used as currency. So it cost beaver pelts to get it. But they, if they found themselves at an outpost or a trading post and they were lacking something, lead, powder, flour, or tea, um, they could trade back in some of that trade silver so they could use it as currency. So this hide's been in here, um, started off like that. It's been in here about a half an hour, and as you can see, it's like a, like a wet rag, literally. Um, 
if we took it out now and just let it dry, it'd turn back into that. So the next process after it's been in the solution long enough, the tanning solution, is we have to soften it. And it's probably one of the most labor intensive. Um, sometimes we've had hides we could stretch in a, stretch or soften in an hour. And we've had other hides that take, uh, usually bigger buck hides that uh, can take upwards of four hours. Anyway, what I do, they claim you can leave it in this solution for about an hour is adequate, but I found leaving it overnight works best. And that postpones that labor intensive uh, stretching part until tomorrow. So I've got uh, three steps to go. Uh, it's out of the tanning solution now, so now I'm going to wring it. Uh, then we're going to soften it. That's the most labor intensive. And then uh, we're going to smoke them. Uh, so this is a fairly big buck hide. Um, this will take us three to four hours, but we were once at an event, uh, a historic event, and our native group had set up uh, their village and uh, there were thousands of people came through for the weekend. It's sort of like a uh, Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn moment where people come by and you tell them it was fun to stretch. And we had literally hundreds of children stretching this hide. And at one point we even put a little toddler on, a bunch of us holding the outside and threw it up like a trampoline. And we took a, probably one of the biggest hides I've ever done. And we actually stretched it in under an hour. It was perfect. Anyway, by myself, this was going to take three to four hours. Um, anyway, so we're going to wring out. What we're doing is getting rid of the moisture, uh, get rid of much of it as I can. Um, I can share a lot on a video, uh, sights and sounds. I can't share smells. And uh, I guess the polite way to put it when you're working with, with uh, this type of tanning solution is it's rather unique. <laughs> So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make two donuts. I'm just going to roll this guy up roughly to the middle. So I got two donut shapes that are roughly the same size, same thickness. And then we're going to start the ringing process. So we're trying to get as much of the initial um, moisture that's inside it. Um, even after we wring this vigorously, there's still going to be a lot of moisture and that's where the softening process comes in. So I'm going to um, ring that, and then what I do is I turn it about an eighth of a turn, ring it again, and I'm going to go around that circle about eight or ten times and to try to get the bulk of this moisture out. The more moisture I can get out of it at this point, the shorter the softening period will be. And you can't possibly hurt this height at this point. That's how tough they are. You can't rip it. I don't care how big or strong you are. Goes into that donut. The easier that comes out after you've really cranked on it with a axe handle. There's an amazing amount of elasticity in the height at this point because there's still a lot of moisture in the center. But essentially, um, the, the fibers are inside are locked up like, like, a, like a weave. And the tanning solution loosens them up because the hide's full of basically hide glue. Um, it loosens them up. So if we keep pulling on it, stretching it, uh, working it as it dries, and we're pushing that, pulling that, forcing that moisture out of it, um, those fibers will, will basically become free floating in there. Um, they'll stay that way once it's softened, as long as it stays dry. Uh, if it gets wet, it'll turn back into that hard thing you saw at the first, at the start of the video. Um, 
before we put it in the tanning solution. So the final step will be smoking and uh, yeah, once I get these six hides done, uh, we'll be doing the last step, uh, actually second last, we're gonna make something at the end. Anyway, this is gonna probably take, this is a small hide. Um, I don't take all these, har harvest all these deer myself, so friends give me hides and I try to use them. Sometimes if they weren't careful in how they skinned them uh, and there's knife cuts, I'll cut sections out. Um, so I think that's what's happened on this particular guy. Um, because there's no sense putting all this effort into something of poor quality. But uh, anyway, the remaining part of this is really good. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to keep working this till it's, till it's soft. <laughs> 